Gotta hug this lady. Isn't she amazing? <laughs> this is like the OG of PRSA, right? <laughs> Ellen, love you. Um, come on up, everybody. Um, proud member of PRSA, and Stephen, thank you for having such a calm election. Boy, we needed that in this particular time. Um, when Allison asked me to do something on influencer marketing, I said, I gotta bring together the best in the business, those incredible PR and marketing folks who are doing it well and doing it right. So I'm gonna start by introducing my esteemed panelists, and honestly, I could just say talk, and I'm done. But let me just introduce, um, we've got, down there we've got Don Brun, she's a director of communications at Cardlytics, formerly at Port Porto Novelli, and Don, it's gonna be interesting to hear from her because she's really gonna be able to talk about the B2B perspective with influencer marketing. Duena, vice president at Porto Novelli, previously at MSL and Ketchum, where we worked together. Um, so Duena is going to offer some great insights. And then we've got Tracy Del Moro, who's director of marketing at Carter, where she works on the beloved Oshkosh brand. And by the way, it goes way beyond the overalls we remember from childhood, just the most adorable clothes out there. And she was formerly at Kids 2, and before that she was on the agency side. So before we get into hearing from our panelists, I want to just kind of include a few statistics. So, few what I called scared straight statistics about why we're here today and why influencer marketing is the buzzword it is. So first off, nine out of 10 consumers trust recommendations from friends and family, even if they don't know them personally. So today's friend and family, today's word of mouth are those digital friends, those digital influencers that affect our purchase decisions. 74% of consumers identify word of mouth as a key influencer in their purchase decisions. And again, our word of mouth today is happening here. Three quarters of Americans own one of these or here on our laptop. So that's where we're getting that word of mouth today. 70% of consumers want to learn about product through content as opposed to traditional ads. Surprise, surprise, right? Trust in advertising is an all-time low. Trust in content from our digital friends is at an all-time high. And don't need to tell this crowd this. We check our social media profiles roughly 17 times a day, which is basically once every hour we're awake. I'm sure in this room we can triple that, right? So back to our panelists. As I said, I could just say talk and they would go at it because they really are doing some innovative work as PR and marketing professionals in the influencer marketing space. So I'm gonna start to just kind of level set to define that word influencer itself. What is an influencer? Any one of you. Dwayne, I'll give it to you because I know you're never shy. Oh, actually, Dwayne is always shy. Okay. Oh, oh. Here, use this one and then we'll figure this one out. Um, that's a really good question. I mean, influencer is a, a lot of different things to a lot of different people, but I mean, basically it's a person who's amassed the following of uh, consumers that matter to you. So, I mean, when you're looking at um, and you're indexing a person's following and you see that they index high on moms or, you know, Gen X moms or whatever that is, you know, it's a person that has followed their passion and been able to, you know, uh, attract a following of people who believe in what they say, who share their same opinion. And so, you know, partnering with an influencer means being able to use that halo for your own brand. Fantastic. I'm going to take it back for one second. Um, great. And then also we've got the other type of influencer, which is kind of the more celebrity influencer, right? Mm -hmm. Let's see if this is working. No. You take this one, <laughs> and look at I, them all working. Look at them all working. <laughs> yeah, and I think so. Then you have celebrity influencers, right? You can have the everyday, authentic, um, kind of everyday person, whether it's a mom or on the B two B side, a CIO or somebody that um, uh, that tech decision makers would would take seriously. But then you also have that celebrity crowd. 
Um, and I think when you're looking at celebrity influencers, it's really important to to make sure that you're not choosing somebody just because they're a celebrity, but because they're a celebrity that aligns with your brand. Um, so a good example of that, I did um, work with T-Mobile last year um, for the Super Bowl. And as we were looking at influencers that we would align ourselves with there, T-Mobile is all about disruption, right? They are the uncarrier. They're trying to change the way that you buy wireless. Um, so the, the celebrities that they went with were Sarah Silverman, Kim Kardashian, um, just people that were out there that had a great following but also resonated really well with um, their potential consumer buyers. Awesome. By the way, since you mentioned Kim, I don't know about you, but I always travel with $9 million worth of jewelry in my suitcase, right? At least. <laughs> so they're going to work on this reverb, but is everybody hearing okay? Great. So for those of us who work in influencer marketing, I think we can agree that we've come a long way from back in the day when everybody wanted those mommy bloggers, right? Um, today, we look at influencer marketing differently, don't we, Tracy? Yeah, I would say that when we're looking at partnering with influencers, we're really looking for someone that's portraying a lifestyle that can really connect. And, and back to the first question you asked, I really think for us, an influencer is a, a trusted friend, someone that you turn to when you're looking for information, guidance, insights. And we love to partner with those influencers that have great relationships with their following, that actually have high engagement. So it's not necessarily that you have millions of followers, but that you are connected with the people that are following you, so. Okay, definitely, by the way, we've got everybody's Twitter handles up here. Um, that was definitely a tweetable comment. Today's influencer is that trusted friend, right? So Dwayne, I know that you, you're like an OG too. You were back in the day when everybody wanted the mommy bloggers, right? But now, <laughs> right? But now, when you look at influencers, you're looking at a whole nother spectrum, correct? Oh yeah, it's, I mean, it's anyone who who reaches the, the vertical that we're in. So it's not just moms, it's millennials, it's, you know, it's uh, lifestyle experts, it's food experts, it's, you know, um, anyone who has a passion for the genre that they're in. I mean, and it doesn't, you know, the thing about it is, is that people have a tendency, and I may be shifting to another question That's point, great. but I feel like this Go is relevant. It. When people are looking for an influencer, they have a tendency to look at numbers first, right? You're like, how many followers do they have? And, you know, oh, she has a million followers, so she must be influential. M maybe, but maybe not. You know, basically, you need to be looking at engagement first, you know? So there are, there are a lot of people out there that, you know, say they're in the food industry and, you know, they may have 3,000 followers on Twitter, but every single one of their followers is tweeting, retweeting, reposting, like can't wait for them to get something out of their mouths. I would argue that that person with 3,000 followers is a lot more influential than the person with a million whose followers do nothing. So, you know, something to consider when you are, you know, looking at leveraging that halo is not just about the number, it's also about, you know, the engagement and what that person really can bring to the table for you. Right. So, Don, you've had the experience of working with celebrity influencers, but also the micro-influencers, those people that Duena says just have 3,000 followers but might be influential in your industry, right? Yep, absolutely. And I would say um, on the B2B side or, um, at a, you know, if you're somebody that's working with a budget that is not the size of Kim Kardashian, uh, which is most of us, uh, that those micro end user, whether it's a, you know, a consumer play or a, a B2B play, um, really cost effectively. Uh, one of the campaigns that we ran um, late last year into early this year was really aimed at using those micro, influ micro influencers, and we worked with, with Danica and her team on it, um, to help drive engagement around what our company does is run like the bank loyalty programs. So if you have Bank, Ameri bank of America, we are the white label solution behind Bank Ameri deals. Um, and we do that for 1,500 different banks. And part of the way that we make money is based off of engagement. So we worked with Danica 
to put together an influencer campaign that really used those micro influencers to educate consumers on what these loyalty programs were, how you could redeem, and we saw great, um, great success from that in terms of impressions, engagement, um, and it was a win for us because certainly that helps raise engagement on our platform, but it also for us made our partners really, really happy. Um, and when you're working with people like Bank of America, PNC, SunTrust, et cetera, it's good that they're happy. <laughs> um, oh, really? Do, do you think banks don't have a lot of positive commentary out there about them right now? <laughs> Won't mention anybody in the audience, okay? Right. Exactly. <laughs> Won't mention any banks right now. Yeah, so to, to have all of these influencers out there talking to their following ab about their great experience with their bank and then their, their followers are then trying it out and, and tweeting about that um, definitely was a, was a major win for us. Awesome. So where do you find influencers? Do you just go out and like wave a flag and say, hey, influencer, I want you to talk about my brand? Duena. Yeah, okay. I'm going to pick on you a lot. Danica is my mentor in <laughs> real life, so she does this all the time. Mm -hmm. So, um, I mean, a good old Google search mm -hmm. never hurt anyone. I mean, before you put money towards it to get someone to search for you, I would say put your fingers to work, you know. You can find a lot on your own just looking up, you know, who this person is, you know, Googling their name, going to their social channels, looking at their posts, seeing who are responding to their posts, how many times their posts are being retweeted or reposted or shared. And, you know, you can gather that intel for yourself. And, you know, once you have a really good list, you know, then you can go to narrowing that down, you know, once you start to talk to those folks, and I'm sure we'll get into, you know, the vetting process. But, you know, beyond that, there are also agencies like everywhere. <laughs> and other, you know, places that have an arsenal of, of influencers already at their fingertips. So if your budget allows and you, you know, uh, want to do something that my husband says I do too much of, which is, you know, use money to solve the problem, <laughs> then, you know, <laughs> you can call them up and they can, can do that legwork for you and provide all of that data for you. Tracy, how about you? Because I know you've really developed some deep, rich, relationships with influencers who love your brand? Yeah, it's, it's actually been a mix. So we definitely work with Everywhere Agency and they've been wonderful in helping us really round out our programs for each season. But I mean, sometimes it's as simple as asking a mom that works with me, who do you follow? Who do you like? Mm -hmm. what, what interests you? And then we'll take a look at that person and see kind of what their engagement ranking is like. Um, we also leverage a lot of our internal creative departments. So because we are a fashion apparel brand, we also want to look at bloggers and influencers that are talking about fashion and apparel, but that's relatable to children. So a lot of it comes from everywhere. It's, it's the Google search. It's the I'm on my Instagram and I see a suggestion pop up of someone of a mom that has two kids and I'm like, oh, I like her photography. Let me reach out to her. Sometimes I contact them directly. So it's it's really a mixture of how we find the influencers that we work with. And I'm going to stick with you for a second because just knowing your brand, you have pretty high standards in terms of imagery and, and in terms of how your product, and rightly so, right? In terms of how your product is displayed, you really seem to have kind of found those influencers who have a natural affinity for your brand, but also without even almost asking follow brand standards. And it's been great. Um, we definitely work with um, influencers that are a little bit more fashion forward that can really elevate our fashion, and our apparel. So it takes it beyond just overalls and denim, but different outfitting for the season. And um, they've done a, a tremendous job at, at putting together kind of concepts for us. And we also work with them one-on-one -on -one too to talk about what inspires them, what do they think their readers will like. Um, and we work together and we let them kind of go with it. Um, oh wait, you're not just handing them a press release and asking them to write about it? No. No? We, no. Oh, okay. <laughs> no. I, I guess mean, those days are over, huh? Some, sometimes it's a little formulaic where we have a group of influencers that we want them to do a specific thing, whether it's related to promotions or sweepstakes or something like that, giveaways. But when it comes down to really generating content, we like them to do it in their way, through their lens and their eyes, because that's what's going to work best for their readership and their followers. So we try not to put too many constraints on them as to what 
as to what they're doing. And then on the flip side, we end up using a lot of that content in email, on our website, on our social channels, and those typically end up getting more engagement than the stuff that we produce in-house. So it's been, it's been kind of a, a little kind of magic fountain that we found of things that we can really leverage. So really using re influencers to create content, repurpose content in a day and age where we all brands are needing a massive amount of content, that's definitely a great idea. So I'm just gonna address the elephant in the room for those PR professionals who were back in the pitching space. You pitch influencers, but you pay them. Okay, who wants to take on that one? <laughs> yep. So yes, you pay them, um, and and having worked with influencers both on the agency side and then also in house, um, I will tell you they're two different experiences. Um, I would say when I was on the agency side, I spent. 12 years with my good friends at Porter Novelli. Um, Woohoo, a whole table at Porter Novelli right there. Woohoo! Representing. Um, and, you know, when we would do, Dwayne and I actually worked on several influencer campaigns together for HP. And um, I would say it was actually a harder sell when you were on the agency side, selling in the paid influencer, um, than it has been internally. Um, and I think, particularly when you're working with big brands, because I've seen this with a couple of big brands. Um, they, they feel that everything is negotiable down to zero. Um, and, so, and, and so it goes back to Duena's point around being able to show the value of the influencer. Um, and I think that's really how you can justify the spend. Um, you know, we've, I think we've paid people a, a good sum of money for some of these influencer campaigns that were not, you know, they weren't scary mommy, right? They weren't the, the top 10 mommy bloggers that were out there, but they had a really strong engaged following that we knew would bring value back to the brand. And I think being able to show that value up front is what helps you make that sell, particularly when you're looking at some of these higher ticket um, influencers. I would, I would add on to that. I mean, as you, in the, on the agency side, you know, ROI is important, right? And you know, when you're looking at the public relations model, they're looking for it to be an earned model. They're like, so why would I pay this person when I really want you to just go out there and you know, chug it and earn it and you know, give, us, give us the value that way? And I would say that you know, I oftentimes say to my client, sometimes it's popular and sometimes it's not, when's the last time you did something for free? I mean, even those of you who are married, your husbands or wives, pay. we pay, we pay, okay? In life, you pay. I mean, if you look at DJ Khaled on his Snapchat, he says everything costs money, right? So, you know, just because it does, doesn't mean that there's no value there, you know? And so, yes, does it blur the lines of where we are in PR? It does, sure. But does it have direct connectivity to whom you are trying to talk to about what you are trying to talk about? Does it move the needle for your business? If it does, then let's just take cost out of it. Would you partner with this person if you didn't have to pay them? If your client or your brand manager or whomever it is would say yes, pay her, let's do it. And because it's, you're telling me that it matters to you, you know, what they can bring matters to you. And I would add to that um, because I think what part of what's made it easier for me to sell in these types of campaigns internally now is that I, I sit directly under marketing. So I sit under a marketing budget. And I think that makes all the difference if you're, you know, particularly on the agency side and you're being funded by communications, by, by PR, or you're even, you know, sitting PR in-house that is not, um, you know, combined with marketing. Knowing where to look for the dollars um, because I think the marketing groups that I've worked with are, are much more inclined to pay for influencers. They are used to doing that for ad campaigns and other um, paid events that they're doing. So knowing where to look for those dollars, I think is really helpful too. It's interesting because my story is a little bit different. So, so for us, it took a while for people to get comfortable with paying influencers and doing campaigns because we couldn't always necessarily directly tie an ROI back to the campaign. Mm -hmm. um, and sometimes you can't put a price on what it is that they can do versus what we do as brand marketers. I mean, what they're doing is, is far more beneficial, it's far more impactful. So it took a while for people to, 
realize that, oh, okay, this actually works. Like we can't say this is the actual ROI, but I can look at traffic in our stores and say traffic is up this month and we had a program running all month or impressions are up. I mean, this back to school season, we just hit 100 million impressions over one campaign, which is huge. Thank you, Lindsay. Um, but um, those types of things have a lot of impact and just getting people accustomed to it and wanting to invest, um, that took a while for us to do. I want to come back to the ROI in one second because that is so important to our audience. But because we are talking about paying influencers and because I am standing in the room of PRSA professionals, um, I would like to make sure we understand that we follow guidelines around disclosure. So anybody want to talk about the guidelines we follow or? Yeah, I mean, it's simple. They need to follow FTC guidelines, point blank period. If they are representing your brand or a client's brand, you know, they need to be familiar with those guidelines. And if they're not, that's a problem, you know? So, um, I mean, that's a very simple thing. You can pull them online. So familiarize yourself if you're venturing into that territory, you definitely want to be aware of the rules and regulations of things. And I always say to that point, you know, when we're looking at an influencer, when I'm vetting the influencer, I think back to the, remember in the old days when, you know, you had the three R's, reading, writing, arithmetic? Yeah. Okay. So I have a three R's of, of influencer, basically. It's references, receipts, and ROI. So one, when you when I work with you, I want you to come to me with references. If you have been with brands before, you should be able to give me contact information for people who have worked with you so that I can connect with them and find out how was the relationship with this person? Was it easy to work with them? Did they post on time? Did they follow guidelines? Did they were they of value to you? I want to have that conversation with other people in the industry and that's not a hard phone call to make. Two is receipts. I, I challenge you to Google hashtag receipts and you will come up with some of the funniest things you've ever seen in your life. But receipts, <laughs> I say bring proof. You tell me that I should pay you $5,000 for two tweets and one Facebook post and I call bullshit. Sorry. <laughs> I said I wasn't going to do that. I say if you should have $5,000, show me the receipts. You show me where your posts are worth $5,000 to me and I'll give it to you. But if you can't come up with the receipts, you can't have my money. Three, ROI. And that is something that I pull for myself, right? So once you give me your references and once you show me your receipts, I can then have the ROI conversation with my client. I can say, here's the value. Here's what's gonna happen. But I had to empower myself and vet that through and get that information first. Awesome. So I'm going to move beyond the FTC guidelines issue, but um, FTC does have guidelines. They're available online. If you're not familiar with them, please familiarize yourself. And also, if you find them confusing, there's another industry organization called WOMA, Word of Mouth Marketing Association, that kind of demystifies those guidelines so that when you do enter into the territory of paying influencers, you definitely want to make sure that you are following issues of disclosure. Can I add something really yes, quickly please. to that? Dan Danica's been with me through um, dealing with our legal department. Um, I wasn't going to say anything. <laughs> <laughs> I figured that might be where you were going. But um, because we are a brand and we put ourselves at risk working with influencers if they're not following FTC guidelines, I think it was, was it Saks? that recently got um, Lord and Taylor Lord and Taylor mm -hmm. Lord, Lord and, and Taylor, Taylor that recently got sued it sent our legal department in a frenzy um, they were like oh my god are we checking every post and I'm like well I'm personally not doing that <laughs> but luckily the agency everywhere agency that we're working with is and we have to supply proof to our legal department to make sure that we're actually enforcing FTC guidelines and if we are not we have to go back to that influencer and say, hey, you forgot to put hashtag ad or sponsored or whatever it is. But um, from a brand perspective, it's, it's really huge because that could make or break the brand in terms of exposing us to liability. And then it also impacts our relationships with influencers. Thank you for sharing that. I wasn't going <laughs> to mention it. Um, so let's talk a little bit about ROI because you do have a campaign where you were able to track the ROI I'm just going to remind you, it was called Break for Spring, yeah. and actually it's up for a PRSA award. And we're definitely going to be there that night with our fingers crossed. Um, 
So I know you cannot reveal sales figures, but can you talk a little bit about how you constructed that campaign so that you were able to measure ROI? Yeah, so, um, so part of it of what we do is we look at impressions and engagement and pieces of content that were created, but we also look at coupon sales. So with every campaign that we do, we launch a coupon associated with it. That way, if I have to tie direct ROI to a campaign and report on it, I can. Um, and I will tell you, the Break for Spring campaign, which was focused on spring break and Easter fashion, um, the, the return on investment was literally 100 to 1. What we invested came back 100 fold. It was incredible. Um, so that, that goes to show the power of an influencer and what they can do for a brand. And we don't work with really um, high influencers. A lot of them are mid-tier or just starting out or um, people that we've met along the way. So it's, it's a nice mix of influencers, but, um, but it definitely did amazing work. Well, I definitely think in your case, just because I'm very familiar with Oshkosh, they definitely are very careful to find those, and this is where I am going to use the word mommy blogger, yeah. mommy and daddy bloggers, mommy and daddy influencers that already have a natural infinity for your brand, yeah. who have a natural relationship with their brand, who love posting pictures of their kids on Facebook, on Twitter, on Instagram, and everywhere. So having that embeddable coupon meant that you were able to track. So there are ways to track. You just have to get a little bit creative about it, right? Um, Duane, I know you've taken some pretty innovative approaches to influencer marketing, particularly I remember when you were at Comcast and almost like creating the influencer. Is that a good one to talk about or? You can pick another one. No, we can talk about Comcast. <laughs> um, you know, Comcast was interesting because, of course, you know, they are a brand with a, with a um, very strong consumer reputation, right? <laughs> you know, people feel strongly about Comcast. And, you know, so that's not, that's not an easy... It's not an easy situation, right? So we developed a, a, a campaign for Comcast in which um, to create, a, provide a divide between them direct to consumer, right? Because when the, anytime they open up any social channel, whatever, people, it's like people are waiting in the middle of the night to go on and throw on every expletive they've ever learned just so that they can, you know, put their frustration out there. So instead, we created a program in which we created an influencer. I literally went out and cast a gentleman, named him, branded him, and put him out there as the fast life of Ty, right? So this guy was living a fast life. Everything that he did, we juxtaposed that to the services, service offerings of the brand. So he was at parties, he ate fast, he did speed dating. Everything that he did, they could correlate it and tie it back to messaging of the brand. Along with that, he had friends. Those friends were influencers. I was in three different markets, and we would find the people in that market that really made sense for Ty to be friends with, so that when he traveled to Miami, he hung out with DJ Irie, which is literally the unofficial mayor of, of Miami. There's no one down there that doesn't know this guy. He hung out. They went to a party together, very tame, nothing off brand. They, you know, went to the, you know, perfect spot in Little Havana and got a, you know, cafe con leche and they, they did Miami together. The, he was able to leverage Ty and other influencers in the market, I had about 12, to leverage their halo and be like, okay, so I like this guy. I like his friends, I like who he's hanging out with. And you don't beat up on the guy next door, right? So if, when Ty talked about the brand, and we had a deal with the brand, and this was hard. 40% brand, 60% everything else. So oh, the brand- really? Did the brand want you to talk more about them? The brand wanted 90% brand. <laughs> really, does anybody ever, anybody else have that issue in the room? <laughs> <laughs> but we had to, you know, we basically, we inched toward a higher number, but we started low because we needed the, gap in between what they felt about Comcast and what they would eventually feel about Comcast based on his post. So the, the integration of the brand was, you know, it would be, he's traveling on a plane and you would see him looking at his iPad and the iPad would have the Comcast or Xfinity Loco on the top of it. It was small things, nuanced things, or he would talk about speed, that kind of stuff. So 
you get where I'm going with it. But basically, that was a way of leveraging influencer and also creating one that didn't even exist. We built his social channels from the ground up. We put paid behind it. It was just a different way to kind of, you know, engage in the influencer playing field and see how people would respond to it. And they responded favorably. They stopped beating, they never, po we had like a maybe 3% negative comments across all of his social channels. And normally Comcast had about 99.9% .9 <laughs> of negativity on their channel. So it was successful. So that's actually an interesting topic. I wanted to move to Dawn about that for a second because what Dwayne is really talking about is getting hyper-local, getting hyper-specific. So I'm just gonna go back to the Cardlytics example one more time because not only did you have to get hyper-local, but you had to find influencers that were banking at specific banks. So, wanna talk about that? Yeah. Uh, so yes, we, we certainly had to find people in specific markets that were, um, we focused on a couple of our bank partners that included Bank of America and PNC. So they weren't credit unions. I mean, there are a lot of Bank of America customers out there, I'm sure some in this room. Um, so, so that gave us, it, it opened the net up a little bit, but um, being able to identify who those people were that were both influencers that also banked there, that's where, back to, to Duena's point, having um, somebody that can help you navigate that network, because that is not as easy to find on a Google search. Um, typically, you can't look up, you know, Mommy Blogger, who is also a Bank of America customer. Um, that is a harder Google search to, to do, so that was where having a, a really strong agency partner that could help us navigate, you know, the thousands of influencers that are out there to find those exact right people that could reach you know that right audience because not only um, did that influencer need to bank with us but that influencer needed to have followers that could possibly um, bank with our partners right so you've got a very small um, audience of people that you're that you're trying to reach with this or attract customers to perhaps switch banks because they want um, a cashback program like this so for us that was really about finding the right agency partner um, and, and coming from the agency world myself, I think agency partners can be really smart strategic parts of your business um, if you can just seek out those right people that you can really trust um, to make recommendations that are going to help you um, as a brand. I'm definitely gonna open it up to questions, but before I open it up to questions from the audience at large, is there a question I didn't ask that I probably should have asked? Any burning topic that you think that you wanna impart to your PR brethren and sisterhood out here about influencer marketing, any tips, any trends that you're seeing in this space? Clearly we know this space well. <laughs> well, I do know, I, I'll, I'll help you a little bit. Um, we definitely have gone through some trends in the industry. It was the mommy bloggers, and then it was the YouTubers, and then it was the millennials, um, are you okay good yeah content creators mm -hmm. so the thing about it is is before it used to be about audience and you know the audience that the influencer could attract and I would argue now that really it's about people who create really amazing content on their own so you can you know you have um, really that organic reach that Tracy was talking about before. Like it's not about necessarily having the mom with the biggest following, but the mom who has great pictures mm -hmm. and is really passionate and she just creates really great photography and content, that is valuable to her. So I would say that there's a really big trend now of making sure that you find people who can, we're not just giving you assets and providing content to you, you are instead are bringing it to us and showing us how you integrate into the brand. That's a really good point. Any, uh, anybody else want to talk about that point? Um, I mean, I think that fit is really important. Mm -hmm. um, we, I have tried working with influencers who are super high fashion and it wasn't a good fit for us, um, but it was a good learning for us so that we knew next time we just wouldn't go that route again. And um, we needed people that were a little bit more relatable and real um, to work with us, but I think, I think fit is, is really huge. We've had plenty of influencers reach out to us and they might be food bloggers. And I'm like, we sell clothes, did you know that? And, um, and they're like, yeah, but I could do something with the clothes and then show, and I'm like, no, I need, I need someone that, even if it's a lifestyle focus, um, still has children and has some way to connect 
our brand to her lifestyle and her kids. So I think fit is, is really important. And then I know, Duena, you touched on this earlier, but I'm just gonna drive this point home a little bit more before I open up to questions. So in this day and age, you're not looking at just numbers, right? You aren't just looking at their UMVs, unique monthly views, you're looking at a whole plethora of issues. Anybody wanna take that one about which, what the things you're trying, really looking for when picking an influencer? Fit is one. I think uh, fit, but also the way, their openness to integrating with your brand in a way, particularly when you're on the agency side, um, trying to sell this in, their openness to integrating with your brand in the way that the client is going to ultimately want them to integrate. Um, and, the, and the way that they would represent your brand within their content. So if they are content creators, and going back to your point of the brand typically wants it to be all brand, um, how creative can they get um, on ways to integrate the brand in without it being inauthentic? Um, and I think Duena and I worked on a campaign at the end of last year that hit that really um, solidly with, with a mommy vlogger around an ink delivery service, um, which sounds super sexy, but actually it's pretty cool and it makes your life a lot it easier. Is. Um, Instant ink, people. <laughs> um, and we, had, we, had a, we were working with this mommy blogger who didn't have a huge following, but she was incredibly engaged. Um, and part of what we asked of her was to, come, you know, to develop these different Star Wars craft projects that, um, that she could go out and promote with her followers. And so um, we really looked to her for how do you integrate in this ink delivery service um, with these cool creative product projects um, for a segment on GMA. Um, and in that case, it was a real battle with the brand on, on how much the brand would be represented. Um, and I think this is another interesting point. Sometimes you're not only paying the influencers, but you're paying for the time. So we paid this influencer, and then we also paid Good Morning America a hefty sum of money um, for that two minute spot on there. And that was a real struggle with the client in helping them understand that even though we were paying for that spot, it could not be blatant advertising, a blatant ad, because they would pull us. Mm -hmm. And then we had just spent well over $200,000 for two minutes that became 30 seconds. Um, so I think that's, that's another thing as you're looking at budget and how you sell that in, um, just to keep in mind um, to be that good counselor and kind of know how to navigate that up front so there aren't those surprises on the back end um, once everything's in place. Yeah, so that's actually a great example, which is one of the ways that we're seeing more and more brands using influencers from a PR perspective is actually using them as a spokesperson for the brand. And I'm just going to pull a quote. I think Todd Smith from Cox Communications spoke here about a month ago. Is that right? Um, and Todd at Cox Communications a lot of times they work with influencers and then they have the influencers um, speak to the local media or go on a morning show and I'm gonna quote Todd and I'm sure he will love me quoting this. He said, and if you know Todd, you'll get the joke. He'll say, what do you want? You want a balding PR professional to go on your morning show or would you like an attractive tech influencer? You know? So definitely from a PR perspective, those people can represent you in the kind of old spokespeople model. So I think we just have about 10 minutes and I'm really hoping that there are burning questions out there. I'll run around with the mic and okay, I've got to go all the way to the back, but that's okay. So stand up, tell us who you are and tell us your burning question about the rise of influencer marketing. Hi, I'm Megan Cantor. Um, I have two questions, actually. One of them is kind of more about um, celebrity influencers. So have you ever worked with a celebrity who had some sort of crisis or, you know, tweet something off brand and inappropriate or just so something that you know, the brand was not happy with and that you had to deal with? And then the second question is more, you know, the blogger influencer space. Um, I know you said that impressions really isn't kind of, you know, measure of measure of success, it's more engagement. Um, but when it comes to reporting our ROI and really measuring the success of the campaign, what numbers do you use? Okay, so who wants to address the celebrity question first and then we're gonna go to the impressions and the reporting next. We're not allowed to work with celebrities, so. <laughs> yes, you're not? Really? I have a 
haven't had any celebrities that have had issues. Um, all of them have stayed pretty much like on brand and campaign. Most of these celebrities are getting a very large sum of money for doing this, and they depend upon these continuous sponsorships. So I think most of them are inclined to do what they're needing to do on these campaigns. I'm sure there's an example, I just can't think of one, of it going really wrong. Um, do you have mm -hmm. one later? Look at this face. <laughs> do I look like I'm to be played with about my money? <laughs> no, I, I really, I really haven't. I mean, honestly, I, 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 I can't think yeah. of anything off, uh, off, off the cuff that someone did or tweeted or created a controversy. But to that point, um, I would say that you know, in social, everything is a crisis waiting to happen, sure. right? So you know, making sure that you are prepared. In, in case someone experiences a brand interruption is really important. It's uh, interesting. I've experienced with um, some of our campaigns, our, our customers are very passionate about the product, and if we ever have an issue or concern come out that someone posts on social, I've actually had our influencers that we've worked with in the past go back and fight on our behalf. We didn't ask them to do it, but they were so passionate about our brands and working with us that they took to themselves to say, actually, no, Carter's in Oshkosh do X, Y, Z, um, which makes it easier for our consumer affairs department and dealing with that type of stuff. But that's been, we've definitely seen a trend in that happening over the last year. Part of it too, I would say, when you're working with celebrities, just like any other influencer, the vetting part is really important. So knowing who you're getting into business with, because this is a business relationship and understanding, are they someone that is constantly flying off the handle and saying things that may potentially be off-brand for you, that's not somebody you want to work with. Um, so that vetting process is, is really key. Um, regarding the ROI question, I, I would say it would really matter um, with, if you're in, on the agency side, what does your client want? Like having that conversation up front, if they are hardcore impressions, then that's what you report out on, because those are easy to, to find. If they are really trying to tie it back to sales and spend and you know uh, marketing metrics, then those are the ones that you set up to to report. So you know, I we say I say engagement because we say engagement because it's really that is showing action. Right, an impression is who saw it, who potentially saw it. Okay, we, we, who potentially saw it. But an engagement shows who did something about it. And I would argue that you know, when you're trying to make a proof, a proof to your client on value, you wanna be able to show them who did something about the information that you gave them. Were they passionate enough to retweet it because they wanted all their people to know, which also speaks into impressions? Did they share it? Did they you know, comment on it, what did they do with it? That, because that's also going to give you information as to how you engage moving forward. You know, like what campaigns you need to run and, you know, the engagement will tell a lot of different stories and it'll provide you with a lot of different roads to go down as far as reaching your targeted consumer or your targeted, you know, whether it's B2B, your, you know, end user. It'll tell you a lot. For us on the client side, we look at um, obviously coupon sales if we have some sort of coupon associated with it. Um, we look at new to file, which is wh what percentage of new customers did we see happen in that time frame. Um, we look at site traffic, so how many people were referred back to the site, how many clicks to the site. Um, traffic in store, so how many bodies did we get to walk through the door. Um, we look at SEO. We look at engagement. We look at types of content. So there are a lot of things that we look at when we're doing our programs. Um, and you know, for us internally, when we have to report in ROI to our SVPs and presidents, um, it helps to have all of that information. So a lot of times our campaigns are pretty robust in looking at all of those metrics, whether it's something that every agency pulls for us or it's something that we're pulling internally um, to show the success of a campaign. Awesome, and I'm just gonna address the influencer question, which is the biggest issue right now in influencer marketing and celebrities is the fact that there's a few celebrities who are serial offenders of not honoring FTC guidelines or not disclosing that they were paid. And Truth in Advertising recently very publicly outed a few of these. Um, some surprise names out there, believe it or not, the Kardashians are 
Amber Rose, a few others who have a tendency to post pictures on their Instagram of, oh, I just love flat tummy tea and aren't disclosing. So um, I would say that's the biggest issue of working with celebrities is they're the ones you need to make sure that are disclosing because it's a hot topic right now and, and you, chances are you don't want to end up on the front page of the New York Times like Flat Tummy T did for not disclosing. So I'm going to pass it over to my good friend Rosemary here. So from GPB. <laughs> Thank you for the plug. Yeah. Have you pledged? <laughs> oh, yes. Have you pledged? You, you know, you can, you can still pledge, still donate, support uh, Georgia Public Broadcasting all year round. Okay, so after my plug, um, I have a two-parter. So when you are working with influencers for the very first time, how do you go about setting the parameters of what they can and can't do? as well as what would make sense for yourself as a brand or organization that doesn't sound too advertorial. And then the second part of that is, especially when you're in the nonprofit space, how do you go about setting up a rewards program? Because as you said, a lot of influencers are now used to being paid. Um, and of course, as a nonprofit, especially a government nonprofit, we're not allowed to do that. So we do want to offer some incentive to them. So can you give me a sense of what would be a good idea and a safe idea to make them feel special for what they're doing for us? Two great questions. Mm -hmm. Can your partners help you? Are there benefits of people who are partners to Georgia Public Broadcast that can benefit your influencers to take your hand out of the pot but still provide some level of compensation or whatever to your influencer? Something to think about. Don't want to don't want to get in trouble, but you know definitely there could be a partner that you have that has a you know soiree coming up and they wanted tickets to it, you know. So can you get them tickets to the soiree or whatever it is? You know, there's all different. You know, the thing about it is influencers are most of them, not the celebs, real people, right? They real people with real concerns and real needs, wants and whatnot. And so a lot of times it's not, it, they don't always need money. Sometimes it's just an in-kind kind of transference of goods that could help. So maybe that's an avenue to think down. Well, I mean, we don't necessarily do that, but when we're working with other brands, we do a lot of barterships or bartering. So um, for, first thing I can think of is, would you give them an opportunity to come on one of the shows or maybe a spotlight on the website or, um, We've done social media takeovers, those types of things, so that we get credit, they get credit, um, and everybody walks away happy and feeling like they got something from the partnership. Awesome. Well, I've just got a clue from my boss here of the day that we are at the end. Just, I want to say thank you for everybody coming out. These, these three people really on the panel are probably the most innovative people in Atlanta right now working in influencer marketing. So if you do have specific questions to them, come up and ask of them. And thank you so much. I'm really honored to be here. Thank you. Yes, thank you, Danica, Tracy, Duena, and Dawn. Thank you very much. And that ends our program. Hope everybody has a great afternoon. And we'll see you next time. Excellent. Thank you. You guys were great. Thank you so much. Good.